What up, world? And welcome back to another episode of the Seeds of Success podcast. It's your host, Colin Walters. And if you're interested in real estate investing, this episode is for you. Or if you're interested in simply learning about what real estate investing is, maybe you're trying to strategize how to cash flow properties or get started with a home buying process, this episode is for you. We have Michael Krabzlowski, a seasoned veteran in real estate investing. He's been investing in over 12 years in Corvallis, Oregon. He's my realtor who helped me buy my first house. And he has five cash flowing properties that bring him money month over month, year over year. We talk about tips, strategies, philosophies, and mindset with real estate, getting started in real estate, and what steps you can take today to start your journey. And so if this sounds like anything you're interested in, stay tuned, buckle in, and I hope you enjoy this episode with Michael Kravzlowski. Here we go. Here we go. Michael, welcome to the Seeds of Success podcast. It's, it's awesome to have you on the show. Colin, pleasure to be a guest on your show. Thank you so much for thinking of me. You're very welcome. And thinking of you, I have been a lot recently because you are you know, quite honestly, a, a huge reason why I have found such a passion for real estate, along with personal development, and just how to be, um, honestly, the best consummate professional that I can be. And I admire the work that you do. I admire the way that you treat your clients and just people in general. And it, it's, it's been awesome to get to know you over this last like two year period in Corvallis. So so thank you for your time here today. Right back at you. Yeah. Well, for everybody listening, for everybody watching, thanks for tuning in. We have um, Michael Kravzlowski on the show. And Michael, if I mispronounced that at all, please let me know. I've, I've practiced it multiple times and it's a tough <laughs> one, but. <laughs> Colin, um, I think it was good enough. You're good. <laughs> all right. Well, um, and, and Mike, I'll let him introduce himself here shortly, but just real quickly, Michael, um, when I was looking for a home in Corvallis, Oregon, I was looking from afar. I was looking from Seattle because that's where I was living. And then Shelby and I, my fiance and I, were going to be moving to Corvallis, Oregon for her, for her medical school. And I started watching YouTube videos to figure out what the heck is going on with Corvallis. I didn't know much about it. And I kept stumbling across this guy's YouTube videos right here and the amount that I was learning while being entertained at the same time, it was just a super valuable experience. And at the end of every YouTube uh, video, Michael says, hey, if you or anyone you know is moving to Corvallis, give me a call. And by probably the seventh or eighth video, I called him. And <laughs> this is how we're talking here today. Michael has, was my my realtor for helping me secure my first home in the, in the home buying journey and, and real estate venture. He's helped me get started in real estate investing and has, you know, I'm in that next stage of now looking to move out of that first home and rent it on a long-term lease. He's helped walk through me, um, you know, with a lot of this process. And so that's a little bit about who's on the show here today, but Michael, I will turn things over to you. Who, Maybe if you just want to let the audience know a little bit about sure. a little bit more, fill, fill in the blanks and the details. I'd love that. Absolutely. So, you know, the the fun part, but sometimes confusing part about who I am is that I've got these two things that I'm doing here and they're both related to real estate. Mm -hmm. So I'm a real estate investor who then became a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And and so we have conversations about real estate, but they're very different things. They're two different, you know, businesses, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so I've been a a real estate investor for a dozen or so years. My wife and I got started uh, buying cash flow positive rental properties here in Corvallis, Oregon, after I was a laid off public school teacher. And we needed to figure out how to make our own financial future. And that's what that ended up looking like. And then years later, I became a real estate agent so that I could help other people do the same thing. So how did you decide, first off, Cool journey. Sorry to hear. I, <laughs> I I do forget at times that you were laid off as a teacher. I remember that you were a yeah. a, a teacher, and so I, I you know I am sorry to hear. That. I'm sure you were an amazing teacher. But how did you decide to focus on real estate, and why did you choose that path for financial freedom? Sure. So 
when when I was getting laid off from teaching in Corvallis Public Schools, it was it was a pretty traumatic experience for me. And I know that's a first world problem, uh, but I thought I had life figured out, and obviously I didn't. And it was actually my wife, Ray. I want to give her all the credit here. She got started reading all these books on financial literacy, mm -hmm. and. And eventually she was like, Michael, you've got to read this book. And I know we're going to talk about books a little bit later, but it was Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I don't agree with everything that's in that book, but a lot of it is absolute gold. And she said to me, she's like, Michael, we need to take the information that's in this book and go implement it and do it. And, you know, leverage other people's money, which real estate allows you to do. And instead of having the American dream as it looks for most people, which is buying a house, she said, we need to make our own subsidized housing and buy rental property that we're also living in. So it was a sort of version of house hacking. We bought a duplex and lived in half of it and rented out the other half. And we fixed stuff up and then moved into the other side, fixed stuff up. But we didn't fix places up, flip them and sell them. That's never been our story. We're long-term hold real estate investors who acquire property, fix it up, often live in it while fixing it up for years and then end up keeping properties as rentals and so that was our financial journey and it ended up working very well and i would say very predictive predictably over about a decade to to really start snowballing and and meeting our financial goals it was not a you know get rich quick there's there was nothing overnight about it um but it was it, it made sense it wasn't that complicated and i want to now help other people do what we've been doing I have about three questions from that, and I know we'll, <laughs> we'll get into the, the last one last because it's in regards to the book that you're writing in order to actually help people get started. But sure. before we get to that, I am curious. You get laid off, and you essentially have no, no job at this point in time, but you have an idea based off of the book that your wife, Ray, had read, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now you have this philosophy and this direction that you're thinking about heading. What were some of the first things that you did to actually acquire that property and that duplex? I feel like a lot of the people, including myself, listening to the show, oftentimes, you know, the the plan, the the direction can make sense, but we get stuck, or at least I feel stuck, of knowing what that next step is and what do I do from there? What did you do to actually sure. get started? So you know, I think I think the most important things of how to get started for from our story, which other people can can duplicate, are that we were saving up as much money as possible, which wasn't actually that much, but we saved up as much as we could. You know, you had to get our financial house in order. So, you know, have a basic budget or spending plan, if you don't like the word budget. Um, and and get some stability in that regard. And I did actually end up getting hired back. So so I wasn't an unemployed person then trying mm. to qualify for a real estate loan. Um, after all that happened, I got hired back. And and so there's not a gap on my resume, but I got a literal pink slip getting laid off from teaching. And they're like, you know, don't cry too much. It's going to be OK. Go get a math certificate. We'll try to hire you back later. And they did. They hired me back later. Um, but it was never the same mm. because my mindset has changed. And you talk about mindset in your content, which is major. That's super important. Um, but but to answer your question, um, you know, we got our, our basic financial house in order and then read a bunch of really good books that I'll happily share with you. And then we put together a team, right? You don't go through something like this in life, trying to start a business or become an investor or you know, do anything of significance without help. You don't do these things alone. And so the most important thing that we did was we put together our financial team, which for us ended up being, you know, an incredible local realtor who was one of our most important professional relationships in life. And, and that's what inspires me to hopefully do just that for others. Um, and a great local mortgage broker to give us financial advice along the way. We uh, got in touch with Oh my gosh, you know, a handful of people, a great accountant, right? If you're going to follow in my footsteps, you need a great realtor, a great lender, a great CPA. I mean, this is the financial team getting your all stars, your MVPs together, um, connecting with some great fix it people to help you because you can't DIY everything, nor should you. Um, and then some other key people that are, you know, trusted advisors on your team. Um, it's good to have a lawyer when things go wrong and hopefully you don't need them that much, but then you also need them when things go right to put together trusts and LLCs and stuff like that and give you advice. Um, and, and uh, you know, some other 
people along the way get connected with great property managers in case you need them and and put together a team you know you don't do this this kind of stuff alone and so that's that's what's fun for me is i get to be a part of people's teams such as yourself yeah and i i appreciate you being a part of my team and so it sounds like just to recap that number step one getting your financials in order putting aside what what does that look like putting aside X amount of, of dollars or into a bucket that's essentially dedicated towards real estate investing. Is that what that looks like? Definitely. Yeah. However you want to phrase it. Buckets are great. Uh, my wife loves to call the investing accounts that we're slowly putting funds into and then, you know, waiting for a great opportunity. She calls it the money cat. You know, it's money like, it's cat. just, it's theirs that you can, you know, pet it good night and it'll purr <laughs> and eventually it'll buy a rental property, that kind of thing. That's um, awesome. <laughs> but <laughs> But yeah, getting getting your getting your basics in order because you don't go out of order, right? And I'm I'm quoting uh, a mentor of mine by saying that money has a sequence. You know, I I did not invent that phrase, um, but you don't go from you know having credit card debt in one day to the next day buying a rental property, right? You you figure out what the sequence is. You get a budget going. You pay down your consumer debt. You talk to these other great team members, your realtor, your lender, you know, your your tax professional get their advice about how to improve your credit score, what kind of things to do to get ready for, you know, having a down payment and some closing costs, see what the market is actually like in your local area so that you can be an informed consumer and take action in it. So <clears throat> thank, thank you for that. Uh, never heard the analogy, the, the money cat. That's amazing. And <laughs> so, um, so financials in order, get together a great team and super quickly, just to put that yeah. quick, that, that team together, how did you do that? Did you know people that you, that I'm, in the I'm area? I'm so glad you, you're asking that, Colin. <laughs> so, or what? so, so we're going to go, uh, take a deviation a little bit from, from our story. Cause you found me on YouTube, right? I mean, I was yeah. a talking head on YouTube and, and even though some amazing people have found my team and myself on YouTube and we get to connect with them and, and get to do great things together, my advice would be to get word of mouth referrals. Mm -hmm. And that was how we put our team together. Uh, I was a public school teacher. I started asking around in the school, yeah. uh, you know, talking Maybe. to colleagues and staff members, hey, who's a great real estate agent? You know, I, I, need, I need to know who I should talk to, who I can trust. You know, to serve me well, serve us with integrity and knowledge and expertise. Um, you know, anyone can advertise online and say that they're number one. I mean, it's practically a cliche in the industry that as soon as you get your license, they give you a pin that says number one because everyone's number one at doing something. Mm -hmm. But I think word of mouth referral is absolutely the best way to put your team together. Talk to other people that you know, like, and trust and ask them who they know, like, and trust mm -hmm. so that you don't have to just go interview 20 people and see who happened to have the best bill board advertisement or something, right? Like let's, let's do this a much better way. I'm all about working by referral. It reminds me of the, the analogy or philosophy, who, not how, right. And, and so then just thinking who in your network that you know, like, and trust, and then exactly word of mouth, network marketing, being, and, and being resourceful yeah. and, you know, being involved with that community that you have already built and, and are a part of to see who knows Absolutely. who. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. and, and in this case, we're talking obviously about real estate and real estate investing. And I got to tell you, I mean, the, the best real estate agents that I know, the best lenders that I know, they, they're they not the ones who are advertising all over the place. They don't need to, hmm. right? So their their hmm. clients are their own megaphones in the marketplace. That's how you find people who are really just going to be all stars that are going to spend all of their time working for you as opposed to all of their time trying to get business for themselves. That's a very different way to spend your time. Totally. They have natural advocates who are their clients because of the yeah. great work that they do. Yeah. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> okay. So it, it, it hit me when you were talking that it, going back to mindset and I think an important aspect to touch on real quick is that you, you and Ray, you and your wife made a decision that this is what you were going to do. And then you made a plan and then you started taking these actions in order to go and execute that plan. So it was strategic and it was thought out ahead of time. And Definitely. so I, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I just want to clarify that this is what is happening behind the scenes and with your mindset. So in terms of, you know, it being strategic and, and thought out, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's great, uh, there's great quotes. I wish I could attribute them to the proper people. Right. But a goal is a dream with a deadline. 
Mm. And and there's an acrostic, an acronym about, mm. you know, it's important to make SMART goals. And I'm going to mess this up because I'm nervous on camera, but SMART, S-M-A-R-T, stands for something to the effect of specific, measurable, attainable. And then I don't remember what the R or the T stand for. The T is probably timing, right? But you don't, you don't just say, well, I want to get five rental properties in the next you know, 10 years, or, you know, you don't say something to the effect of to yourself, well, I want to, I want to have a bunch of rental properties that make $5,000 a month, like, okay, that's great, you know, but there's got to be more than envisioning checks showing up in your mailbox for this to actually come to fruition. So you've got to figure out what your goal is, understand to yourself, you know, why you're making that goal, what, what are the criteria that you're setting as the goal? And, and are they arbitrary? Or do they really you know, meet your needs in terms of what you want your life to look like, um, and then figure out, okay, what are the smaller steps along the way that mm -hmm. that you can take mm -hmm. to actually make those come into play? Because if you set a goal that's, you know, too big and there's no smaller steps along the way, then it's hard to achieve it. You've, you've got to have action items that in the short term you can actually do something about and that you can celebrate wins for, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, even if you're, paying down your credit cards. Uh, I think it's in Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. He talks about paying down the smallest ones first. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk about, you know, pay off the one with the highest interest rate or, or to pay off the biggest one. He says, pay off the smallest one first because then you get something to celebrate. And you don't celebrate by going out and swiping a credit card for an expensive meal, but do something to celebrate, mark the occasion, you know, know that you've accomplished one of your goals and that'll help fuel your momentum to go get the next one. Right. It's it's all about the habits and the mindset, not necessarily paying off the biggest one first, but get a win so that you can have that momentum. Um, and I think that's that's important. That really stuck with me. So what was your first goal then? So you made this decision sure. that you were going to go down this path of real estate investing. You start building yeah. your money cat. You start petting the money cat. You build your team of your realtor, your mortgage lender, your um, accountant and CPA, your attorney or legal advisor, if and when you need them. And then um, what was that? So these sound like, you know, some milestones that you have to hit some actionable, you know, steps along the process of this journey. What was that first goal that you were setting out to achieve? So, you know, I, I feel like in retrospect, we might have actually set an arbitrary goal. I think what our goal was, mm -hmm was in 10 years, we wanted to get enough rental properties to provide a financial safety net to cover mm -hmm. our basic expenses, and then some, which I think we had forecasted being five grand a month. You know, that's why I happened to use those numbers a moment ago. Uh, and and I think we set that, that goal, I think we set those parameters because we read a bunch of books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Alan Corey's Million Bucks by 30, and just kind of said, well, the, you know, these sound like good goals. We like what that guy did. Let's make this our goal. Mm -hmm. um, and and then we we broke it down to okay how do we get this first property what does that look like because it was really tempting to still be house hunting to be looking for something that's a liability if we want to use like rich dad poor dad robert kiyosaki terms you know he talks about a normal house as being a liability because he says on a month to month basis it just takes money out of your pocket it's not making you money mm -hmm. so it was really tempting cuz i got hired back to teaching to just do the normal version of all this and be like, how do we get our first time home buyer house? But but then we knew, hey, what if I get laid off again? Mm -hmm. Because the security I thought was there wasn't really there. And that would be a place that would cost us money on a monthly basis. So then we we kind of adjusted to, you know, sticking with, I shouldn't say adjusted. We we were stuck with the let's get cash flow positive real estate and try to find a place that we could house hack and you've done house hacking before with your own Airbnb, you know, in your, in your home, we did a slightly different version of that. We ended up finding a small duplex and we lived in part of it and rented out the other part. And that was our house hack. And, and so that worked because it gave us a place to live. It gave us an opportunity to build up equity over time. And most importantly, if I got laid off again and ended up needing to move somewhere else, we didn't have to sell it. We could rent it out and it would pay for itself. It would break even and hopefully over time even make positive cash flow. But, but you know, we talk about having the money cat or having a bucket. Um, I want to take us back in time about 12 or so years here. When we first started doing this, our our bucket, our money cat was was still pretty small. It was something like twelve, fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars. That's what it took to get into our first property. 
right? And that's another thing that's really neat about real estate is people often think about like, oh, well, I don't have, you know, $300,000 to buy a house. Yeah, but you don't need to, right? In real estate, you're leveraging other people's money. You're taking out a loan. So you don't need the purchase price sitting in your bank account. You need the down payment. You need just the acquisition cost and you can leverage the rest. And that's one of the major powerful things about real estate investment is that you can borrow money to do it. You know, if you walk into a bank or a credit union and say, hey, I'd like to borrow a half million dollars to play in the stock market, they're going to laugh at you. Mm. But if you walk into, you know, your, your mm. lender's office and say, hey, I need to qualify to borrow a half million dollars because I want to buy a triplex and live in one of the units, they say, okay, great. Here's a form for that, right? There is a system in place for that in real estate because that's how it works. So I think it's really important, again, to you know put together that team, figure out what the parameters are and figure out what your strategy is gonna be because there's lots of different loan types, lots of different down payment requirements. There's not just one way to do real estate, which is great. And then you can actually figure out how you're gonna get into your first property. So <clears throat> a lot of different ways that we could go. And, and I mean, yeah. you touched on, you know, Part of me is curious as to exactly why you can walk into a bank and and for property and not the stock market. They do give you that money, right? And you know we we can touch on which I I would like to hear in a minute about some more of the benefits of you know even when we talk about tax benefits and oh, sure. talk about depreciation, um, paying down the mortgage, using other people's money, etc. But I still want to stay on the topic of your journey because I feel like it will help our audience and for those listening and watching to really understand what the natural trajectory can be in order to help simplify what this roadmap can look like. And even just speaking from experience, I know that really understanding the vision of how this works has been difficult for me at times. And so even just getting started has helped me understand, you know, it, it's helped me break down a, a more manageable step-by-step -step process, right? Which was for me, same thing, saving up, a lot, you know, saving up money for what, what was for me, a lot of money at, at the time. Right. Oh, yeah. And then it always is. Yeah. Big, it, it was nothing like, you know, getting that first cashier's check for closing costs and everything. It's uh, <laughs> it's an exciting and uh, nerve wracking and exhilarating experience. Um, but that was basically, you know, saving 20% of everything I was making and putting it right into that real estate investment fund that I had sitting in an online bank account. And then, <laughs> Um, you know, just building that until I got to a point where I felt comfortable to then start shopping houses, start shopping real estate, and then actually getting into the first property. And then, as you mentioned, renting out the the master bedroom on Airbnb, sprucing it up, doing the best customer service as possible and making that super successful. So you get your first house. That was my process. Back to your process is okay. you get this first house, the duplex, and it sounded like you know, from a sense, it was risk averse in the sense of worst case scenario is that you get laid off again, you still have somebody yes. paying into the mortgage. And therefore, you know, the, the worst case scenario was still manageable for you, which I think is a huge point. That Colin, that's major. On. I'm so glad you said that because when you get into rental property investing, um, people people talk about how risky it is. You know, they talk about how a toilet's going to break and what are you going to do and do you really want to, you know, have to fix or replace the dishwasher, all this stuff. Like these are the worst things they can possibly think of. It seems like in conversation. And and what I would tell you is, you know, dovetailing off of what you were just uh, ping ponging back with me here is when you assume these things are going to happen and factor them in on day one and then they don't happen well, then you're doing even better than that assumption was, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I'm a rental property investor. I'm a spreadsheet nerd. I love having spreadsheets. You've seen them, you know, so that we can look at, okay, how much cash flow does this potential real estate investment make? Well, just factor those things in, factor mm -hmm. vacancy in. And then in real life, you know, you're not going to actually have as much vacancy as you have on that vacancy factor. It's going to end up being better in real life. Factor in, you know, whatever percentage for repairs is is standard in your market for your age homes just factor all that stuff in and then you you're making sure that on day one you're making an informed decision uh based on almost a worst case scenario and then the reality ends up being a little bit better so great bonus you know um you know i don't i don't think of i don't think of rental property investing as being super risky because i like to factor in the worst case scenario before I even make the decision yeah I love that. And then if it doesn't happen, then it's even better than we anticipated. And that's 
and that's all the more reason that in our story, my wife and I were focused on cash flow real estate, hmm. not appreciation real estate, because those are different strategies, right? And I'm not trying to invalidate one or say one's better than the other. But for me, I was a laid off school teacher. My concern was not, hey, can we buy a property that 10 or 20 years later will be worth a lot? That wasn't what we were going for. That was that was bonus when that mm -hmm. happens. What we were going for was, can we buy a rental property that will pay for itself if I get laid off again and end up having to move to teach middle school science on an army base in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Because who knows where I was going to end up if I got laid off again. Totally. So, so it was all mm -hmm. about making sure that the cash flow was there for a property to support itself, or at least, if if possible, even pay more than just support itself. But when we were first starting out, we were very highly leveraged, which is a fancy way of saying we didn't have much money. And so we got into our first duplex with a really small down payment. We did a 3.5% down payment on an FHA loan, it's called, which works if you're going to own or occupy and actually live in the property. And and that was how we got our first one going. It wasn't a 25% down payment. It was a 3.5% down payment. Mm -hmm. So because we had you know, a really mm -hmm. small acquisition cost, um, it worked for us, but that also meant that we were borrowing lots more money. Our mortgage was a lot bigger than if we had a big down. And since our mortgage was bigger, our monthly payment was bigger, which made it hard to cash flow a place. But we did find one that at least paid for itself and was breaking even, even with our 3.5% down FHA loan at the time. And over time, I got to tell you, Colin, you know, it's been the best financial decision we've ever made. I mean, in the past 12 years, rents have gone up, home prices, home values have gone up, and and the cash flow has has been really great to see happen. And that's the point of you know the content that I'm working on behind the scenes that you already know about. I'm sure we'll we'll get to that. Is you know, I don't I don't necessarily feel like everyone in the world needs to set a goal to buy five or 250 rental properties, but look at the power of just getting that first one. Mm -hmm. Right? Look at the power of just having one. You know, you can you can have a well-maintained real estate investment. That's a great place for your tenants to live in. That can also be making you some money. It could be an asset to the community. It could be a great neighbor to live next to. You don't have to be a slumlord to make money doing this. You know, the bar is, the bar is low. Jump over it. <laughs> I mean, this can be a win for everybody. You don't have to be taking advantage of your tenants to be making a profit. Um, and, and over time, if you're patient about it, you really can have an enormous impact on your personal finances by owning a piece of the rock. And so I'm a big fan of, you know, getting information like this out there to people. Owning a piece of the rock. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So <clears throat> you just touched on some of the content that you're working on behind the scenes. I think what we can go ahead and, and transition into that. And right before we do, maybe if you sure. could let the audience know, you got that first property, you landed that duplex, and then you were in that for how long until your second? And now how many properties? Yeah do you have to date? What's your portfolio look like? Sure, sure. So so our first duplex, uh, we still own. And and it's kind of an unconventional duplex. Let's see. So it's it's a four-bedroom house on one side, and it's like a one-bedroom apartment on the other side. It's not oh, symmetric. Mm -hmm. And and we moved into the four-bedroom house. We camped out there. It was way too big for us. We camped out there to fix up the one-bedroom because mm -hmm. it was in really rough shape. And then once that was fixed up, we moved into the one-bedroom and rented out the four-bedroom, which is a pretty good example of, you know, for a lot of people, what would be a sacrifice to make along the way. We didn't take the, the luxurious side of it. We took the tiny little 550-square-foot, mm -hmm. one-bedroom, one-bath apartment, like a mother-in-law suite. And we lived there for seven years. Um, and at one point, my wow. wife and I lived in that one bedroom, one bath apartment, which was above the garage. Uh, we lived there and we had three cats. And at one point we had family staying with us too. We had five people and four or five animals. Um, and I had to like DIY finish part of the garage and then later on decommission it. So no one would ever live in the garage again. <laughs> and, um, and we stayed there for a long time. Um, and now at this point, we have got that duplex, the original one. We've got another duplex, which is doing awesome. It's a nice big one. And then we've got three single family houses all here in Benton County um, that are all cash flow positive rentals that we've got slightly different stories for each one of those. Mm -hmm. But but again, I just keep looking back to the power of just getting that first one, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
And one of the things that people in this financial space probably read about is the Burr method. I think that's a bigger pockets or deeper pockets thing, the buy, renovate, refinance mm -hmm. method. I I don't I'm not an expert on that, um, but I think I did that once actually. I mean, you know, when you own a property long enough in a market that's going up, you know, you're paying down your mortgage, or I should say your tenants are helping pay down the mortgage mm. and the value pr probably goes up over time too. On average, we see that happen a lot, which is time for a good disclaimer, right? This isn't actually financial advice. Consult a CPA, tax professional, lawyer for legal advice, consult a financial planner for financial advice. But in general, over time, we see real estate values appreciate. Um, you know, that's, that's a pretty common assumption over the long term. And, and one of our properties, we did refinance at one point, took a bunch of money out of and and sat on it in a bank account as a money cat and bought another rental property a year later. We've they're spawning. We've had one property already buy another house for us. Like that did it with its own money, not with what I make in my nine to five mm. business as a real estate agent. Mm. So there really is a lot of, you know, a lot of power there. And and we've we've managed to snowball these a few times and get Get a nice little mom and pop rental property portfolio going at this point. It's a very, it's a very cool story. And one that, <clears throat> you know, I think in, people can relate to or be inspired by in the sense that you got started by simply asking questions to those that you knew. That's where it all began, right? Yeah. Being a, a middle school teacher, asking around who knew who, who could help get you started, and then here you are with five cash flowing properties you, uh, 12 years later to to show for it. And so transitioning now into your your content, you're writing a book sure. and you use vacations to go and actually <laughs> work on yeah. the books that you're trying there, to, a, to get there's out. There's a few people that know that. You're one of the people that knows that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of my friends and colleagues probably think that uh I, I took a lot of vacations in the last year and I did, but I worked on all of them writing a book. <laughs> so yeah, the, so the book that I'm working on right now, cause I feel like I've started writing books three times in my life and I've never finished them. So starting writing a book, it turns out is not an accomplishment worth celebrating. You got to do something with it. But the one I'm working on right now is about our rental property investing journey. And I feel like the rough draft is pretty much done, except I keep going back and realizing, oh, wait, I need to you know, flesh out this concept a little bit more. So I guess it's not really done. Uh, but my wife told me the other day, she's like, Michael, that's called writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so that is, that is basically just our story of how we how we got into our properties in terms of literally like what were the loan types, then down payments, and what kind of returns did we get on them? But then over time, how did they build up to be the investments that we wanted them to be? Um, and and it's I don't know I don't know if it's a very exciting story or not, but I hope it's inspiring. The challenge that is going to happen with our story is that not everyone's gonna actually be able to relate to it. I appreciate the compliment you're giving me there, but but there have been a couple of times where we we borrowed money from outside sources, not just a bank. We borrowed money from like, you know, friends, family and stuff to help make investments come together. And not everyone's gonna be able to do that. And so I feel like the possible critique of my story is that it's very privileged in that regard, but that's not how we started. And real estate allows you to do just that. I mean, that's one of the powerful things about real estate investment mm -hmm. is that you can borrow other people's money. So that is part of our story, but I'm going back in and saying, okay, now that we've gone through these five properties, yeah, we borrowed money to help get this one off the ground. What if that had never happened? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, what's the power of just getting one going? You know, it's th th this book title's already taken, but The American Dream 2.0, instead of buying a house to live in that just costs you money every month, what if everyone who wanted to do this kind of stuff, you know, instead of that house hacked, you know, did what you're doing or, or did what I've done and, you know, bought a multifamily and lived in one of the units, you know, that's, that's not necessarily what the American dream looks like, but, but I think it's a valid version of it that can have enormous financial impacts over time. And, and so I, I don't necessarily think everyone's going to read my book and just rinse and repeat it, but I want them to take away, Hey, this is worth doing. And you don't even have to get, a lot of properties going for long-term having a big difference. Mm -hmm. well, 
just like with any book, Michael, we're not going to be able to relate to a hundred percent of the content or a hundred percent of what, what is being offered or right. But there will be takeaways. And, and a key thing that I keep hearing is regardless of being able to relate or not being resourceful is one thing that I continue to hear. Right. And so that's just a creative way of thinking of how can we accomplish this? Right. And so, you know, for somebody that doesn't have the family or, or friends to go to again, coming back to the who, not how, who does have that potential investment funds that you could negotiate with and, and have a conversation with to see if they would be willing to, you know, help fund and, and help, help, help you get started in this. And, you know, of course, having that conversation about what that looks like and returns, interest, whatever it may be, but continuing to be resourceful, having conversations and talking with people that, you know, I can trust is absolutely like a relevant theme with everything that you've done. Yeah. You, you don't have to accomplish it on your own and be the only person, you know, standing at the top of the mountain saying, mm -hmm. I did it. I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's realistic for a journey like this. You mm -hmm. get to the top of the mountain by having lots of people, you know, throw you a Gatorade along the way or something and, and give you advice and, and cheer you on and, and be a part of the story too. Michael, two, two questions for you before we jump into the, the final four here. And sure. First question is with anybody who's looking to, to get started, I know we've talked about how to get started a lot, but any other advice for beginners or individuals on the outside looking in or people who are maybe just getting started and you yeah. know, looking for some yeah. direction, anything that we haven't touched on, what, what would you recommend? Any tips, advice? Totally. So, you know, in the real estate investment side of things, especially when you're new at this and, and you're susceptible to being influenced by media sources that aren't necessarily working for you. Um, I, I'm going to bluntly say, don't give so much credence to news headlines. And I'm not trying to bash the news. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is that every day there is clickbait saying the sky is falling, the market's crashing, the world is ending, all this stuff. And when it comes to real estate, you know, it's, it's nice, it's important to have an understanding of markets, but real estate is local. Scratch that. Real estate is not even local. Real estate is hyper local. It doesn't matter what home values are doing or home prices are doing, because those are totally different things on average nationwide. What matters is what's happening in the community that you want to be investing and living in. And not even just that, but what's going on with that house right there over at 123 Main Street that you're in love with or have a great spreadsheet for, and you can see the potential in. Mm -hmm. That's what matters. Not what's happening nationwide on average, according to a headline. But how many offers is this house getting? What does its potential look like? What's its cash flow going to be, right? You're making a hyper-local decision, not something that you should read a newspaper headline or just listen to any old generic podcast that says, oh, always offer 3% less than the list price of a property, and then try to apply that to what's happening in your town at that street. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. All the more reason to have a team of trusted advisors, local professionals guiding you along the way. Totally. <clears throat> um, second question is how did you become a realtor? How did, and, and I know we're talking about real estate investing. Sure, we haven't sure. quite touched on the transition for our listeners and, and our, our viewers here of what actually happened in order to become a realtor. So, so again, they are very separate things. I know there's a cliche there. There's a lot of real estate agents that became real estate agents because they wanted to basically just save on their own commissions, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, that's not our story at all. Um, what I've done in my life is I've done my best to become who I admired. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm aware of that. I became a science teacher because I really admired my teachers. Um, and I was also raised in a house of educators, so go figure, right? That's where teachers come from. But but that's why I went down that career path. And then eventually, I became a real estate agent in part because I realized that I had gone back to teaching, but I was talking about real estate. That's where my passion was. It was becoming very clear to me. And the realtor that I looked up to, who was Ann Morgan here in our local you know, REMAX office in Corvallis, um, you know, that's, that's who it inspired me. That's who it helped us in our journey. And, and that's, that's who I wanted to become for other people. It's such a great answer, Michael. And it's something that, you know, I, I think 
aside from real estate, it's just such, such a, a prominent point to double click into is just continuing to work towards embodying the characteristics of the people that we admire. And it's something that I, I definitely think about. And, you know, I, it's something that I'm, you know, questioning myself on a lot of the time is what are the characteristics of the individuals that I admire the most? And how can I continue trying to implement those into, into my life and, and what I do in order to help people be of service and of value? How did you, it's a good way to live. How did, how did you, um, when did you know it was time to make that transition? I know we're going a little off, <laughs> off script, off prompt here, but how no, did you, okay. how did you get started like transitioning into that role and, and like, like what was kind of the, the thought process or the journey? I'm, I'm wow. So I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be authentic and honest with you here, yeah. even though it might sound weird, but I, I really remember this one summer uh, in between the school years, obviously that's what summer is that I'm referring to as a school teacher. And mm. I, I remember actually, I remember feeling pretty burnt out, you know, I hate to say it, but I was pretty burnt out as a school teacher. And, and I'd gone back to teaching for years. I think I taught for another five years after being laid off mm. in the public school system here. Um, and I have enormous respect for the public school system here, by the way. Um, that is one of the best things about this community. It just happens to not be as good since I left. But, <laughs> mm. um, oh man, I'm the only one that laughed at that. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> but, but I remember this one summer, you know, I, it, the decision had, should have been made earlier, but I'm always really slow with these things. And then I realized later I should have taken action earlier. I remember one summer I was actually in like the local Kmart when we still had a Kmart and I was checking out in line buying laundry detergent or something. And I saw some, some students, they were like right behind us in line checking out. And I just wanted to say hi to them. I didn't know their names. I didn't really know who they were. I just knew that they were seventh graders going into eighth grade. And I was an eighth grade teacher at the time. So I knew they were about to be my students. Now, just said, hey, you know, how's it going? I, I didn't know who they were, but we all recognized each other. Um, and instead of responding politely, actually, they uh, just like literally cursed me out in the checkout line of a Kmart while I was buying laundry detergents. I don't even know who they are, didn't even know their names. And I was like, wow, like this is so crummy. It just, you know, I didn't respond very well to that. And And what happened in my mind was I just started thinking, do I really want to go back to doing what I'm doing or is it time for a change? And it was really past time for a change for me. Mm. Um, and I never went back. I didn't go back to teaching that fall over the summer. I, you know, I started talking with my realtor. I started talking with Anne that I mentioned, started talking with our mortgage broker with family members. And I ended up committing to, to becoming a real estate agent and starting a real estate business, because that's what that is. Um, and I sat down and just, just buckled down and I spent three weeks studying for the exam. I took it, I passed it luckily, because I'm a good test taker. Teachers tend to be good test takers. And then I started my business and uh, <laughs> right around September 3rd, when all my friends and colleagues were going back to teaching at school, I was starting my real estate business. And, and I probably should have done so earlier. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I still miss teaching, you know, I, yeah. I really do, but, um, but I was, I was burnt out and needed to follow a different passion that was already very much there. And I just probably didn't have the courage to follow it sooner. It's probably what it was. Well, and something I've been thinking about it, w with you is it's not that it, it, it doesn't appear that you ever left teaching. It's just in a different form. And I, I hope I hope so. Thank you. I'm gonna take that as a very high compliment. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the amount that <laughs> you have taught me. I I can't. I I think I need to on air publicly apologize for the amount of phone calls and text messages I have sent <laughs> you throughout the last two years, Colin. trying to figure out what the heck to do and you, um, how to. You, <laughs> you how don't to have to apologize because when you're working with someone who is there because it's you know a passion of theirs, mm -hmm. they love doing it. Yeah. And. And this is definitely something I, I truly love doing. And it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to get to be a part of your team and, and get to help people like you. So well, I, you do well, not I need to apologize. That. <laughs> and I have not, anybody who has talked to me about my real estate um, purchasing and investing journey knows how, how highly I think of you as, as a realtor. So I appreciate uh, everything that you've taught me. And with that, we can dive into the final four questions here, Michael. Final four. I'm ready for it, you. We can fire them <laughs> off. I know that we've brought it up 
a couple times before the show, during the show. But the first question is, what are your favorite books? And okay. I know that is plural for a <laughs> for a reason. So favorite so, book, Michael. <clears throat> so the I, I'm not a person who reads for leisure. I read lots of stuff like this, Colin. I read mm -hmm. personal growth and development and entrepreneurship books and financial strategy and stuff. Um, so I'm going to rattle off right from the get-go the ones that started our journey. Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. A tremendous sure. book on what I'm going to call basic financial literacy that is not taught in schools. Don't agree with everything that's in there, but that was instrumental in our journey. Um, Alan Corey's A Million Bucks by 30, um, who I'm very much, I guess, emulating, if that's the right word, as I write my book that I don't have a title for yet. Um, it's just, you know, following this guy's journey of oh. having a 10-year goal to financial independence, which he did through real estate investing. And it's very very well done and very entertaining to read. Um, Darren Hardy. I don't remember if you and I have talked about him. Darren Hardy is the compound effect. I think, compound effect. There you go. Yeah. Um, that book is really well written. Um, compound effect and the entrepreneur roller coaster. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed from him and Dave Ramsey's total money makeover. I again, don't agree with everything Dave Ramsey says, but a lot of what he says is worth its weight in gold. Um, and then to put something else out there that's fun, but also personal growth and development. Have we ever talked about my favorite negotiation book? Uh, I, I don't believe we have. Can All right. I take a guess? Go for it. I, <laughs> sure. Um, is, is it Never Split the Difference? We've talked about it then. There's we, no way that just happened otherwise, right? <laughs> I it's just every every so often I, I can't think of any other negotiation books, to be honest. And I'm sorry if I stole your thunder. Um, oh, what, what's your backstory? You brought the thunder. What, what's your so, backstory on it? So Chris Voss never split the difference. Mm -hmm. Is it's just a a tremendous book when it comes to content on negotiations but it's also very entertaining. It's written from the perspective of an FBI hostage negotiator mm -hmm. um, and never split the difference. You know, I don't, I don't care if as, as a listener uh, to this podcast, I don't care if you're not in a professional negotiation capacity. I think you'll really like this book just as a human being, because there's a lot of interactions, interpersonal relations and professional relations that are negotiations, even though you might not think of them or label them as being negotiations in life, but we're constantly negotiating with each other. And that's a really interesting perspective on negotiations. And it's very entertaining to read. It's an awesome book. Um, yeah. if, you, if you don't mind, I have a super quick story. I'll keep it extremely brief. It's Long your podcast. Short, go. <laughs> was, was, thank you. was leaving Las Vegas and I decided to put my name on the on the roster to get a flight credit and hold back until the next flight. I won that mm. credit. So I went out on the next flight. Somehow, some way they put me in first class on the next flight out. And then Fun. <laughs> the gentleman sits down next to me and I know and he looks super familiar. And I notice he's oh got a gosh. Rolex on his wrist. And I'm like, <laughs> this dude looks like somebody. And sure enough, he opens up his MacBook and on his screen says Christopher Voss. And my heart skips three beats, and I'm like, no freaking way. So the next are, thing, are you kidding me? Were you I'm, sitting I'm next to him? I'm not kidding you. This, I was sitting next to him in first class in the first <laughs> what for a <laughs> uh, a free plane ride that I was getting. It was the craziest thing. My heart was my heart was racing, and I was trying to figure out how do I, in a non creepy way, start a conversation with this guy. And besides just saying like like hi, like obviously that's the normal thing. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get up. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the bathroom. I'm going to come back and then I'm going to make a conversation. And sure enough, like um, we chatted for probably the last 30 minutes of the plane ride. Awesome guy. He gave me oh nothing but gosh. undivided that's, attention. Picked his brain. That's wild. It was, it was super cool. Super <laughs> so, cool. Down to earth. So Colin, for, for your listeners, folks out there, just so that you have something ready to go next time you sit next to Chris Voss on an airplane yeah, ride. Yeah. I, I would have started that conversation by saying, have you seen the movie Black Swan? Because it's just a very subtle joke because he has nothing to do with the movie Black Swan about mm -hmm. ballet, but his negotiation company is called the Black Swan Group, which is a negotiation reference. It's, so it's way that's... better than what I came up with, which is <laughs> let me go to the bathroom and think about this. Now, now I'm wondering if we had actually talked about this over the years or if it's coincidence, but that is incredible. I Awesome book. We'll leave it at that. Thought you would enjoy that story, and that's a much better punchline than what I came up with. So, um, second question here, Michael, is yes. what is your favorite quote? 
favorite quote would probably be, I think it's an Einstein quote. He's got a quote about compound interest. It's something to the effect of those who understand compound interest earn it, and those who don't understand compound interest pay it. I think mm -hmm. that's how the quote goes. And I think that's very germane to our conversation about getting involved in real estate investing um, because it's, as many people have called it, the eighth wonder of the world. And it's it's an important thing to understand as opposed to pay. I don't want people mm -hmm. paying compound interest on their credit cards. I want them earning compound interest on their investments. Um, third, third question here is All right. bucket list item. What's on it? You know, I'm never very good at that kind of stuff, so I'll have to go with what's probably an obvious answer. Um, I really hope my wife listens to this because she'll just give me a weird look. All right, bucket list, Colin. Bucket list for you. Uh, I want to go to Paris, France with Ray, and I want to jump off the top of the Eiffel Tower while wearing one of those wingsuits um, and, like, wingsuit fly down no, right you into a French – Oh, totally, yeah. You're I want to wingsuit no down kidding. into a French bakery – and like land in the French bakery where she happens to be having morning coffee, uh, take a big bite out of like a fresh baguette bread and then give her a big romantic kiss in France. Like that's, this is that's the definitely... most, this is the best answer I think we've had on the show, Michael. And isn't that what everyone says? Oh no? my God. I'm, I'm revising my entire bucket list in, in my head <laughs> right now. So we, we both know that this will never happen though. <laughs> Hey, but never... we'll see. Maybe I'll hit a few of the things off that checklist. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And at the, at the very least, we'll, um, we'll just hit the squirrel suit here in the Pacific Northwest if we can't make it to, to Paris. So we'll just scratch, <laughs> scratch all of them. We'll just do the squirrel suit. Sound good. She, she's not going to let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've had the conversation before, but I did enjoy watching you bungee jump on one of your YouTube shorts recently. Oh yeah. That, um, you never know what some free time and, and a drive can do for, for this individual. <laughs> Last question yes. here, Michael, and again, right. I appreciate you being on. This has been an awesome conversation. And um, the Thank last you. question is, what would 85-year-old Michael say to you right now? And that can be life, real estate, so life, personal, Life advice you, to myself. Whatever that means um, to you. All right, Colin. So 85-year-old Michael would say to me, hey, buddy, eat a salad and go for a walk. Oh um, and, and I've been trying to be better about that for my birthday. I got myself a little step counter here and, uh, and I'm not hitting 10,000 steps every day, but it's starting to create the mindset and the awareness mm -hmm. and the habits mm -hmm. of, of getting out there and just deliberately getting out for a walk, which has also been great quality time with my wife. Um, so yeah, 85 year old me would say, eat a salad and go for a walk, mm -hmm. hire some more great people mm -hmm. so that I can actually spend more time with my wife and, and would remind me of a quote from my grandmother who actually said this to my dad once. Um, the, my dad's got, a, my parents have a very great work ethics. Uh, my dad worked a lot of late nights as a college professor. And, uh, and she said to him once, she's like, you know, the computer doesn't kiss you back. <laughs> In other words, don't work so much. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure to always be spending time with family. Um, yes, but, but your wife does. So put that screen down. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I think that's what 85 year old me would say is, is be healthy, have healthy habits and a healthier lifestyle. Um, don't be so afraid of hiring great people. That's gone very well um, so that you can actually have work-life balance and not just work. Um, and I think that's the most important part in life, which I'm working on achieving is, is having, having a great business and also a great life at the same time. Because there's no point in you know, having just one of those things in terms of obviously just working too much. It's great to be driven, but you've got to have a life too. Well, and I think that based on the conversations you and I have had in the past, that's something that you have actively worked on and been very intentional about, which is now starting to outsource some some work and outsource responsibilities yeah. in order to, A, and, and it's being done with phenomenal people on your team, right? That you know, like, and trust. Yes, of course. I've got and I've so, got some great people I'm working with right now, mm -hmm. and and it's it's been hard. It's been hard to delegate yeah. and really trust people, but but when you get great people, at some point you train them well and you mentor mm -hmm. them, and you got to trust that they're they're you hired them for a reason. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're teaching Michael. 
You're, you're all, right. you're teaching. <laughs> well, Michael, I, we can go ahead and, and, and wrap things up. I really appreciate you coming on the Seeds of Success podcast and sharing your expertise, your knowledge, teaching our audience the things that you've done in your real estate investing career and journey and sharing some of your, you know, philosophies and mindset with us. And so for everybody listening and, and tuning in and viewing, thank you. And, and Michael, I, I really do appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for being here. Well, right back at you. I mean, Colin, you're taking your free time and putting this resource and these resources together for other people to help them better their lives and be the best version of themselves that they can be. And you could be doing anything you want with your time. You know, we all know that. So I want to just commend you for making the investment in yourself and humanity along this journey. So I hope that people get a lot of value from this as we start the conversation and get to keep it going as time goes by. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for having me on. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you. And I will see you soon. Cheers. Bye for now.